Anthropomorphic animals are a keystone of the furry fandom. It's a known fact that most were introduced to the fandom through a movie or a game from their childhood that utilized animals with anthropomorphic properties, whether it be an animal walking on two legs, behaving as a human would, or anything of that sort. These traits aren't exactly reliant on each other, however, as there are many animals found in older media that exhibit human behavior while still being a quadruped or anatomically correct animal, to varying degrees of success. And speaking of Lion King, or pretty much any old Disney movie but mostly Lion King, Simba, Nala, Scar, even Zazu, looking at these characters, ask yourself this, could they consent? This is a discussion that comes up in the fandom time and time again, and every time it comes up, it sort of feels like this large, swift reaction from multiple sides of the fandom before it dies out, only to respond later down the line. A reaction that usually tries to answer a specific set of questions. Is feral porn okay? Are all quadruped characters classified as feral? Are you a zoophile because Nala's bedroomize made you feel some type of way? Who the fuck is Harkness, and why is he testing me? Well, if I wanted to give you an accurate view into this portion of the drama wheel, I would have to let you guess for yourself, as the majority of drama you'll see from here is usually caused due to people appearing to have different definitions as to what Beryl actually is. But as I want to be somewhat informative here, we'll be going over the viewpoints that led to this drama rising as frequently as it does as well as a few examples of drama that have occurred in the fandom revolving around feral content. Now, be warned, we will constantly be playing devil's advocate as we go through this, so please bear with me. I know how the internet can get when someone tries to both sides a situation, but with that being said, let's get into it by defining what actually constitutes a character as being feral. Something surprisingly hard to do when it comes to a fandom as expansive as this. So, what defines a character as feral? Well, the most universal definition of feral would be anatomically correct animals in general. This usually defaults to quadrupeds, because when people hear feral, a wild animal like a wolf or a lion might come to mind, rather than an animal that's actually bipedal, like kangaroos or ostriches, or most birds I guess. As expected when the definition of the word is resembling a wild animal. However, some consider feral to be more similar to feral's other definition of being in a wild state, especially after escape from captivity or domestication. If you go by that specific definition of feral rather than the other, then there would probably be some characters who are on all fours that you may not consider feral, as truly the quadruped wolf can't be feral if they're exhibiting human-like sapience. This singular differentiation is the basis for this drama continuing to resurface, as there is no singular definite guideline as to what constitutes a character as feral in the fandom, you're going to have a lot of people butting heads as to what's right and wrong when it comes to this, how much a character has to be anthropomorphized to not be considered feral. So the obvious thing would be to have a set of guidelines in place, and so guidelines would be forged. Guidelines that some will still probably have their gripes with. The Harkness test is a set of guidelines used to determine whether or not it would be hypothetically right to fornicate with a fictional non-human creature. Named after the Doctor Who character Jack Harkness, an omnisexual who would sleep with just about anything, these guidelines are pretty simple as there are only two questions that these rules consist of. Are they an adult and can they consent? So thanks to the Harkness test, I can post images of Warwick from League of Legends, knowing that he is an adult and could probably consent, and bravely tweet out things like, would. To widespread agreement, surprisingly. When looking at most anatomically correct animals, however, the latter is usually pretty hazy, as even though that character is talking and is considered an adult for their species, is it right to want to smash a goose that could verbally consent to the point they have an entire musical number about how horny they are? I'm the goose. goose. With the juice. juice Thanks for making that a thing, Balto3. The point I'm raising here is that the hardness test isn't some be-all, end-all solution, nor does it really try to be. If you weren't going to shag Scar before being shown this test, you're probably not going to want to after. The Harkness test's purpose is more to explain how someone could consensually get torn a new one by Smaug. 
Hypothetically, of course. But when it comes to the furry fandom especially, the Harkness test becomes less of a band-aid fix. It would be pretty easy to cover the more obvious anthropomorphized characters you see the fandom constantly falling over. But what about quadrupedal characters? What about characters like Stella, who are proportioned anatomically correct, but can walk and talk like a human? What about bipedal characters who are anatomically correct below the belt? As I said before, the smoking gun for most feral related drama is often the fact that the people of our fandom will never agree fully on what properly constitutes a character as feral. We all have our own definitions and lines as to what does or doesn't fit the label. While my own line pretty much renders any quadruped or anatomically correct animal out of the question, some might have a more lenient line that allows that because of it being fiction. Personally, I never really was a fan of that reasoning, as it always gave off the same vibe as those who defend Lolly, even though some would disagree with me on that to an extent, which is to be expected. Although I can at the very least concede that it probably would be more ideal to want to bang Kangaroo Jack opposed to Kana, I, I think that was her name. Back on topic though, because of this all being fiction, People usually aren't going to have the same visceral reaction to it as they would if it involved a real animal. At that point, it becomes more a discussion based on moral viewpoints rather than whether or not sexually abusing the family dog is okay. Because of that disconnect from reality, everyone is going to have a different personal scale as to what they would deem as feral and whether or not sexual content surrounding it is okay. A scale that, as you've probably come to realize, may not be the most concrete and consistent for some. And that inconsistency can act as an accelerant to the grease fire that is feral drama in the furry fandom. Using a bit of my own hypocrisy as an example, I've already said how I usually deem most quadruped animal characters as feral, and usually draw the line when it comes to more not safe for work aspects. However, I do find myself simping for a character by the name of Aurelian Saul, a giant eons old celestial space dragon. A space dragon who, by my own previously stated definition, would be considered feral. And yet, I love this character so much that I want him to leave me seeing stars. You could consider me hypocritical for making this exception, and honestly, I couldn't blame you for it. It's just that to me, I see the character of Aurelian Saul to be much less feral when compared to that of just a talking animal. I see him as this charismatic egotist, taking pride in the stars and galaxies he's forged. Why I would simp for such a self-centered character like that? Ah, the joys of lesser organisms rising up to slay their betters. If only they were aware of the impermanence of being, or oh, the permanence of me. I made the stars, but you inspire me to make more. A snow globe? Perfect for my collect- To destroy you. DESTROY YOU! He is a dork and I love him for it. <clears throat> but still, even if it is me being attached to this character's personality and story more so than the giant space dragon housing it all, Having that inconsistency can feed directly into this drama by raising the question of how feral is too feral, or to word it differently, how anthro does a character have to be to avoid being considered feral? And even after that, we'd have to answer the second part of this drama. Even if that character is anthro enough, is the sexual content of that character considered zoophilic? Because you can have a furry character that stands on two legs, speaks a human language, and is of adult age, but are you now a zoophile because you gave that character anatomically correct genitalia? Why is that inclusion so common anyways? By now, I'm sure you've probably noticed the pattern here. With how much I've been hammering at it while jumping around from question to question, you've probably noticed how this drama has sparked on for as long as it has, solely because in the furry fandom, Every facet I brought up here has been made entirely subjective. For every person who publicly states their opinion on what Feral is and if it's okay or not, there will surprisingly be a pretty even amount of both support and pushback on the subject. Let's use the anatomically correct gonads as an example, as their inclusion is pretty common in furry smut in general. You will see it quite a lot without even trying, 
although it isn't exactly a furry staple by any means, as there are quite a few furry artists out there who will straight up refuse to draw any schlong other than humanoid. Just like Feral Smut, there are some members of the furry fandom who refuse to engage with it due to seeing it as an enabler of zoophilia, holding this belief despite the disagreement of quite a lot in our ranks. But this does raise the question of why this anatomical correctness isn't very frowned upon, as you'd assume being avidly into those aspects would bring you closer towards that zoophilic line. I mean, if it didn't become a meme, singing no cock like horse cock would just be a self-report, right? Just like how singing Ram Ranch automatically makes you gay, or so I'm told. Well, I've been thinking it over, trying to figure out the reasoning as to why people are fine with this without chalking it up to enabling zoophilia. And I have a theory to it, or at least what I hope the reasoning to it is. You see, the main part of anthro furry characters is in the name, anthro. Anthropomorphizing animal characters is the stepping stone of all things considered furry. And in the process of anthropomorphics, we're providing human traits to animal characters, making them more like us in a sense. This would include more intimate aspects as well, aspects that go along the same crossroad as any other part of the body. Just as you could go from human-like hands and legs to more animal-like paws, surely some would see it the same way below the belt. Rather than seeing it as a way to peddle zoophile accessible furry smut, they simply see it as another case of anthropomorphizing the character. They see it as more of an exotic schlong, a dong shape expansion DLC if you will. They see it as just another dong shape as opposed to getting off to the animal that anatomy is attached to. At least that's what I hope the reasoning is. I guess I would rather people who are into it just see it as that rather than a way to softly nudge people into zoo content, but there are some shoddy people out there who will use it to do just that, unfortunately. I don't exactly want to lump everyone who's into it under that pseudo-zoophilic umbrella, but that starts to get a bit difficult when there are adult toy companies in the fandom that willingly admit to using life casts for canine and equine shaped toys. Stuff like that starts to muddy and blur the line between fiction and reality. Is it just fiction because it's an adult toy now, or is it a zoophilic fantasy because an actual animal was used to cast that toy? Is it morally right to reference images of the real deal instead of life casting? As you can tell from that ramble, not everyone in the fandom would consider some a zoophile for their interests in dong shapes other than human, although there are just as many who would consider it to be the case. As obvious as that statement may sound, this portion of the drama wheel wouldn't exist if that were universally accepted. Instead, we have a back and forth clash as to what side the fandom should take as a collective. Is Feral Smut just drawn bestiality, or are you an out of touch puritan for not differentiating fiction from reality? This objective tug of war usually makes up the majority of conflict around this dialogue, if you could even call it a dialogue. When this drama plays out on Twitter mostly, it's more comparable to a drive-by. Someone will give their opinion on it, and before you know it, they're getting blind-fired by opposing opinions and people portraying them as the devil to their collective opposition. Which is only made that much funnier when the person's opinion is seeing dog dongs as suvilic. But since I've been kinda generalizing this to an extent, it would make sense to talk about some of the more feral-related drama that's happened recently in the fandom. Just to give you a view into what could start up a discussion such as this. When it comes to drama about Feral not safe for work in the fandom, more often than not it's going to stem from some form of call out post, and due to the person being called out for engaging in Feral not safe for work, not everyone in the fandom is going to see it as something worth giving a damn about. One of the more widespread cases of this would involve an internet user by the handle of Kind Time. Back in June 2022, callout posts would arise against the user when the content of their alternate Twitter account would come into question. This content consisted of artwork of their fox persona depicted as feral in sexual situations, anatomical correctness and all. Upon this being broadcast, Kime would see a wave of harassment due to their indulgence in the content. In reply to this, Kime would post a two-part video response on Twitter days later. To give a brief synopsis of this video's main point, 
they would explain that they weren't a zoophile and had no sexual interest in actual animals. Instead, their interest was in role-playing as that animal, including role-play with sexual themes. And to be honest, the whole thing was meant to be an alt for a reason, you know? Like, this was meant to stay separate and if you wanted to see it, you'd see it, and if you didn't want to see it, you should block and you should move on. I feel like it should be pretty clear that uh, I don't act out the things that I see in fiction. I think most adults are aware that that's not how this works. And um, I don't want to do anything <laughs> in real life. I, that's never been a question to me or anyone who knows me. Um, you know, a lot of it for me is escapism. Feeling alienated with being a human and wanting to be an animal. It's sort of like the evolution of RPing dogs on like the playground in elementary school. Um, I am now an adult and I do that same sort of RP, but with other adults through art and online, you know, and because we're adults, it's, it's going to be an adult related RP. And if that upsets you, I'm, I can't change that. I guess TLDR, I want to be the animal. I don't want to do things to an animal. Um, <laughs> anyways, I hope that clears things up. From there, talk concerning this would slowly fade away into obscurity until it would be brought up again not too long after, just not how most would have expected it. In September 2022, Kaim would be spotted attending free migration, to the dismay of a user on Twitter. This user would post an image they had taken from behind Kaim with the caption, look who decided to show up. Pretty sure that's a new DHC suit next to him too. Now, this post would be polarizing for several reasons, along with the user referring to Kaim by the incorrect pronouns, something they went on to correct, the user would be critiqued for their decision to publicly shame Kaim the way they did. This decision would go on to reignite the debate on whether feral smut was considered zoophilia. This only escalated as others brought animalistic features of any kind into the discussion. Whether it be through an interaction I'm still somewhat personally skeptical about, or the satirical post that would soon follow not too long after. Ultimately, opinions were given and back and forths were had, but in the end, there was no significant sway in fandom opinion, as to expect from most fandom drama. But this wouldn't be the last time a mention of time would result in another feral-driven discussion. During Anthrocon 2023, the majority of online discussions about the con surrounded a fox puppet dancing at different locations of the venue. The creator of this puppet goes by the user handle, The Hearth Fox. At the time, the enjoyment of seeing this fox puppet across Twitter, as the site just refused to let you use it, caught on pretty quickly. The message of positivity behind the puppet was pretty refreshing to see. But as Anthrocon came to a close, an exchange Hearth had on Twitter would spark up another fandom discussion concerning feral artwork and zoophilia. On July 6th, in response to a tweet where Hearth talked about how her account was followed by Obama, a Twitter user remarked how Hearth was followed by Kime Time. They would allude to Kime being a bad person because they like feral porn and have commissioned just that of their Sona. Hearth would respond by saying it's fiction and it's not real. In their own words, they're not actually feral or hurting animals. Why does it matter if someone imagines themselves as an animal? We're furries. Our community is based on respect as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. Kaim hasn't hurt a soul. This was quite a polarizing take, not due to the Kaim portion specifically, but Hearth declaring air stance on feral smut. This resulted in a pretty large discussion as more eyes came across this interaction. If you followed me on Twitter, you're probably more than aware of a tweet I made at this time that would result in me getting roped a lot closer to this drama than one would expect from a tweet intending to be an observational joke. I'll admit, I could have approached that situation with a lot less defensive hostility than I did, but we won't be going over that situation as it diverged into a completely different, unrelated direction than what we're discussing here. The feral drama to come from this wouldn't go into full swing until after our exchange. But if you wanted my thoughts on that whole thing, I guess you could just pause the screen and read this real quick if you're interested. But back on topic though, this exchange would return furry Twitter to the back and forth of whether Feral is zoophilic or not. As Hearth was at the center of the discussion this time around, he would chime in with the recurring sentiments in the fandom of keep furry weird. Something I've personally seen as an oxymoron since I first heard it. 
Alongside that, hers would upload a TikTok expanding on air thoughts about the current feral smut climate. I have one last thought about all of this. And it's just something that I've noticed over and over again from every single one of the nasty people that have put hateful comments on me. Their main argument is, That's weird. That's gross. And I've taken the liberty of looking at their profiles. A lot of these people are under 18. A lot of these people are 19 or 20 years old. They're very young people. And they... They haven't accepted the fact that the world doesn't owe them complete comfort all the time. You know what? There are going to be weird, gross things out there. I hate child beauty pageants because they're disgusting. But you know what? I can't stop them. And guess what? No one is going to stop enjoying furry art because you think it's weird or gross, okay? The Lion King came out before you were born. King Robin Hood turned a billion people furry and he's just a fox standing on two legs you cannot make this ludicrous argument that oh fiction affects reality oh yeah so if i think about it hard enough i'd become a cartoon fox don't get me wrong i'd love that that is not how the world works sweetheart you need to step down calm down grow up and learn some manners the world doesn't owe them complete comfort all the time. Well, I don't disagree. Besides that, their main point is that there are going to be weird things on the internet, but you don't have to go out of your way to crusade against them. Personally, I get it. I really do. In my time online, I've gone from giving zoo files the benefit of the doubt to telling them the game end themselves to just blocking, because I can no longer be bothered to explain why fucking animals is wrong to grown fucking adults. But at the same time, I don't see an issue with a person voicing their discomfort about something. You know, respectfully, at least. If people don't want to engage with or interact with people who deal with feral smut, they have every right to voice it. Just like those who want to be vocal about getting their rocks off to it. If anything, being open about where you stand makes this controversy a whole lot more manageable, don't you think? Well, about that. Sometimes there can be a such thing as too vocal about something. Normally you'll see those who are against feral smut saying that those who condone the work shouldn't interact with them. It's a pretty straightforward statement, all things considered. But what if you proclaim that point so loudly and in such a visceral manner that you got accused of mirroring Nazi symbolism? Well, that would happen to an artist on Twitter who would post this artwork as users became more vocal about condoning feral smut. In July 2023, Deary Vavi would post this image with the caption, Hope all degenerates go to hell. The image itself would tote the text, Fuck your fantasies, kill zoophile ideology. Obviously, this would receive its share of backlash. From people disagreeing, opposing the post by saying how they like feral smut, or just replying with feral porn. Because nothing separates feral porn from actual bestiality quite like an anthro fox being screwed by a horse. No, not that one. But the criticism that would start to raise some eyebrows would be those saying this artwork utilized thinly veiled fascist symbolism, which... Some of it definitely felt like a stretch. SS bolts, I can see where that's coming from. Victim colored after the trans flag, you've got a point there. This character is stylized to look like the Nazi salute. Not to dismiss this person's points, but I feel like a lot of this only has a semblance of reason solely due to the background being red. Because other than the two things I've stated and the degenerate line, I just don't see where this came from. And even then, the bolt can be explained as motion lines, and the color of the victim can be explained as a fuck up from the artist, as they weren't trying to be transphobic. They were using the colors of the old zoo pride flag. Guess no one got this guy the memo that they fucking changed it. But even with that explanation, I still don't think this art piece relates its message all that well. Because even without the alleged fascism, you gotta ask, why make it a dinosaur harming an animal with those colors? Why not make it a dinosaur tearing up the zoo flag? I understand the logic of this piece, but making an image of animal harm to combat images of animal harm isn't exactly the best idea. Like, I'm not gonna draw a dog getting laid the fuck out to speak up against bestiality, you know? 
Last time I checked, I'm not PETA, nor should anyone strive to be. But the bottom line to this is that the person made a not so good art piece to broadcast their disapproval of feral smut. I don't believe it to be a fascist dog whistle filled image, but it certainly didn't relay its messaging in the most effective manner. But surprisingly there would be an ordeal where we would see Newton's third law in action. As for every arguably over the top art piece disavowing feral smut, there will be an equally over the top art piece condoning it in this case, being posted the next day. In response to this art piece, there would be another that those opposing Deer's view would rally behind, at least for a little while. That art piece, done by the user Gutterbunny, would present itself as an opposition to Deer's work, stating in large letters, fuck fandom cops. This is followed by promote degeneracy, kill fascism, promote sexual freedom, kill prudes, fuck the burned furs. Already, I'm sure you can see why I think of these two as different sides of the same coin. Apart from one being the reaction to another, it also has the same issue of feeling the need to use violence on feral characters to get its message across. Only instead of perceived fascism, we now have implied police violence. Implied to the point that I would have thought this was an ACAP post rather than a piece solely made to say, fuck off if you don't like feral porn. Honestly, it probably would be an improvement if it was remade to be the former. Back on track though. Me attributing it to feral porn in specific may seem a bit off given how general its messaging looks, but the reason I'm connecting it here, apart from what it was responding to, was a reply I saw connected to this artwork that I found kind of funny. A reply to this artwork would read, is cub included? To which the artist would reply with a simple no. This response would turn some members who previously rallied behind the image to garner a pretty sizable amount of disapproval. They found issue with the artist approving feral smut, but not smut of underage furry characters. A uh, rules for thee but not for me scenario basically. The reason I found this funny was because the scrutiny that the artist got here was solely due to placing their own boundaries on a pretty general message. As I noted, this artwork doesn't tackle Feral directly, as it's a pretty broad message that out of context could just mean fuck anyone in the fandom trying to tell me what to do. A broad message that cub condoners would see refuge in had it not been for this exchange. But even with the messaging being presented with either piece, I can't help but see it as overkill. I mean, I'm not particularly fond of feral smut myself, but whether you advocate for or disavow the stuff, I think we can all agree that the artwork used to push either point is a bit much, right? Though, so if the artwork we discussed was an example of going overboard, what would be a more proper solution to dealing with feral not safe for work drama? Well, being blunt and straightforward, obviously. Simply stating whether you're for or against feral smud is an easy way to give your stance on the stuff. I mean, just think about it. You can't be accused of being a fascist simply due to saying, don't interact with me if you're okay with feral not safe for work. Most of the time. And if someone feels the need to make a call out post about how you're into feral, is that necessarily a bad thing? I mean, yeah, your entire online identity is being reduced to a single trait or interest of yours by this person. But ideally, the people who don't condone feral would avoid you if they choose to, and those who vibe with the stuff will probably just go to follow you regardless. Where the issue arises is when harassment gets involved. Now, call me sophist if you'd like, but I'm not going to demonize someone for advocating feral smut by calling them a zoophile. Most of the time. It's more so a case of if we were walking toward each other on the sidewalk, I would probably cross the street opposed to telling you to end up in a ditch. If it's relegated to fantasy, chances are I'd just call their interest gross or cringe and move on with my day since this stuff just isn't for me. My view has become more so just avoiding those who are into feral content and hoping those who harm actual animals get drawn and quartered. And I think that's a pretty reasonable assessment for my side of the fence. I understand the internet isn't exactly a place where you can build your own little perfect portion of the internet, where the people you interact with have none of the traits you deem negative, but you can get pretty damn close by simply weeding out what you refuse to interact with in your own space. As this drama appears to arise whenever someone attempts to push their own standard as to what the norm of the fandom should be, 
And as the fandom will never fully agree on a topic given just how large and diverse it is, arguments will ensue, callouts will be written, beware posts posted, and the drama reignited again and again. So bottom line, the best thing you can do is moderate your own little chunk of the fandom rather than aiming for a blanket standard. Whether you like or hate the stuff, make it known and the rest will work itself out. Hopefully without a callout post accompanying it, but you can never be too sure sometimes. Either way, I've been Benji, and I'll see you in the next video. Stay safe out there. Funding for this program was made possible by...